Rosa, if you are hard, good afternoon to everyone here in the Philippines and welcome to our group audience joining us online. Thank you again for joining us today on this hybrid international symposium on artificial intelligence. We have our live audience here uh, on site at the Philippine Social Science Council Auditorium in Quezon City. Tapos meron po tayo online audience via Zoom. Ang sabi sa akin, nasa 71 na ata ang ating Zoom audience at dumadami pa. Meron tayong mga Zoom viewers mula sa Tandag City, Caraga, Naginian National High School na Union, mula sa Bulacan, wow, from all over. We have viewers from Paranaque City, Apayao State College, Apayao Province, Davao City, Don Mariano Marcos State University, and we also have viewers from Doha, Qatar. So talagang international tayo ngayon. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, talagang sa webinar na ito how AI is shaping and transforming the future of media and communication in the world. Welcome to the fourth and final installment of the Philippines Communication Society's webinar series for 2023 titled Ay Nako! Understanding the Impact of Artificial Intelligence on Media and Communication Education. Dito po sa webinar series na ito, nag-feature po tayo at ngayon mag-feature din po tayo ng diverse group of international experts and leaders who will present the latest research and developments in AI, in media and communication, and its impact on education. Ito yung unang webinar series on AI na isinagawa po ng Philippines Communication Society. As I have mentioned, this is the first and the last installment of the webinar series. We already discussed in the previous webinars how AI impacts content creation and news production in media. Pinag-usapan na rin po na nagkaroon tayo ng webinar series on the use of AI in advertising and marketing. And last month, we explored how AI tools can be integrated into Philippine media and communication education. Finally, in the fourth and last installment of the AI webinar series, we will take a global outlook with the UNESCO framework of human-oriented dimensions of AI and the AI-enabled features of learning. Magandang tanghali po sa inyong lahat. Ito po si Cara Gawin. Chairman of the Chairperson of the Department of Journalism ng College of Mass Communication sa UP Diliman and I will be your host and moderator for today's program. Iba't ibang platforms po na papanood tayo ngayon. So we have an on-site audience here at PSSC. We can also we are also being viewed right now live via via streaming on YouTube at the TVUP channel as well as on the Facebook page of TVUP. It's a Facebook page of Philippines Communication Society, International Association of Business Communicators, PUP Broad Circle, at pati na rin sa PUP Circle of Research and or core. You can also watch us live on the TVUP channel 101 on Signal TV. Oh, ayan, ha? lahat na ng broadcast media, online media, kinover na kaagad natin. But before we begin our program, hindi po magiging posible ang event na ito kung hindi natin pasasalamatan ng ating mga sponsors, yung mga tumulong po sa atin para malunsad ang programang ito. We would like to thank the University of the Philippines System, syempre. Pagpasalamatan din natin ang Philippines Communication Society, UB Information Technology Development Center or ITDC, TVUP, the Internet Television Network of the University of the Philippines, San Miguel Corporation, IPG Media Brands, and McDonald's Philippines. And everyone po who helped to make this AI web series possible. And alam ko, inaabangan po ito ng lahat ng teacher at mga estudyante na nanonood sa ating ngayon, lalo na via Zoom. Magkakaroon po tayo, magbibigay po tayo ng Certificate of Attendance sa bawat isa. Ayan mo, nakikita niyo na po yung Certificate of Attendance na ibibigay po sa, namin sa inyo based on your Zoom registration information. Pero guys, 
kung manonood po kayo, huwag po yung manonood lang mag-log in lang tapos aalis na. Sa huli pa po namin ibibigay yung certificate of attendance na iyan. And also, if you have not applied, applied for or renewed your membership yet, this is your chance to be part of the premier organization that represents the communication discipline to the Philippine Social Science Council. The online membership form is available on the PCS website. Nakikita niyo rin po sa inyong screens ngayon, yung website po ng PCS, ProcomSoc. Dot org slash membership. May nakikita rin po kayong QR code. Just scan the QR code para po sa inyong membership form. And because we want to make sure that everyone is heard and everyone has an opportunity um, to give out their opinions, their questions, we will be using Slido so that our viewers on Facebook, on Zoom, and on YouTube will be able to participate. We encourage everyone to participate. Magkakaroon po tayo ng mini quiz. Wala pong grade. Wala rin po. Wala rin po, ano, premio. Pero ang premio po, ito makikita tayo lahat. Yan. Magaling lang naman po yung mini quiz natin. Meron lang patilang tanong. Dalawa po yung mga pictures. Tapos yung isa, walang tama at maling sagot. Kaya sumali na po kayo. Yung answers will be discussed during our panel discussion later on. For our viewers, including those on YouTube and on Facebook, buksan nyo lang po ang Slido.com. Yan po, gagamitin natin ang Slido for our, for our uh, mini quiz. Fill in the Slido code, ayan po, nakikita ninyo, 326-4621. Or simply scan the QR code na nakikita nyo po ngayon sa inyong screens. Alright. So, ayan ha. I know that everyone is excited to get the show going. So to set the tone of exploring the possibilities, the future of AI in communication and media education and international symposium, let us hear a few words from the president of the Philippines Communication Society. She's also the advisor for public affairs with the University of the Philippines System. Palakpakan po natin, Dr. Elena E. Perla. Thank you, dear Kara. And good afternoon or good morning or good evening to all who are in attendance today, whether on site or online, wherever you are in the world, watching live or watching later as you, uh, you know, at your own convenience. And welcome to the last in our series of uh, Ay Naku, Understanding the Impact of Artificial Intelligence on Media and Communication Education. And additionally, greetings of Aid Mubarak on this celebration of Aid Radha. You know, there was an interesting article in yesterday's Philippine Daily Inquirer. It was titled, Will AI destroy humanity? It raises disaster scenarios where machines will outstrip human capacities, that machines will escape human control and refuse to be switched off. This is a scenario almost straight out of the movie, The Terminator, and has been dismissed by many for what it is, science fiction. Since March 2023, we have crossed and turned the discussion on artificial intelligence, hearing how AI is both cheered and jeered. Our resource persons, as well as our own personal experiences, have shown us that the AI revolution, or evolution, as others have looked at it, is happening whether we like it or not. And as written by various writers, uh, and it, this is a quote, real or imagined capabilities and potential uses make artificial intelligence both welcome and feared. Many look forward to being liberated from tedious and repetitive tasks. Nonetheless, the fear remains that AI may lead to human obsolescence. That's science fiction. 
But this morning's hybrid international symposium, exploring the possibilities, the future of AI in communication and education is squarely in our realm of immediate concern as scholars and practitioners in media and communication. Without a doubt, we, the academics, the administrators, and practitioners need to seriously examine the impact of AI in our current and future practices. As we all want to do in the Philippines Communication Society, we have brought together a diverse group of international experts and leaders from academia, industry, and government to examine the frameworks of human-oriented dimensions of AI and AI-enabled futures of learning. On behalf of your PCS, I express great appreciation to our distinguished panel, Joe Hirokan Hironaka, Jean Linus Dinko, Dominic Ligot, Didith Rodrigo, our moderator, Cara David, and you, our members and potential members of PCS, most especially to our partners at the University of the Philippine System, TVUP, and PSSC. I trust that today's discussion will indeed be intellectually profitable for all of us. Thank you very much. Maraming maraming salamat po, Dr. Nemi Pernian. Thank you very much for that message. Actually, may pinanggap ko itong ano, job na itong pinmoderate this. Ang type na, na, na kiuso ko ba sa title na sabi, ay nako. Eh, ay, 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 ay nako, parang, na parang may fear o parang, ay nako, bago, di ba? So, Tama ang sinabi ni Dr. Pernia, damahan ng mga eh. Lahat ng technology, pag may bagong technology, it's always met with fear, but it's also met with something exciting. Diba? Yung may exciting na, uy, ano nga ba ang mga possibilities? But like what Dr. Pernia said, the AI revolution is happening whether we like it or not, at ang pwede na lang natin gawin ngayon ay maghanda to prepare and to equip our students, our teachers, the academe, our practitioners para mapaghandaan nga natin ito at, uh, at hindi tayo namuno nitong AI revolution na ito. So maraming maraming salamat Dr. Pena for opening our program. Now, it's time for our mini course. Bago natin pakinggan mo ating panel of experts, Magpakinggan muna natin yung ating viewers. Right now, we have 150 plus, ilan na ba? 157, 153. Um, wow, 169 na. Talaga, ano, gumadami. 169 na ngayon ang ating mga, mga viewers via Zoom. Meron pa sa Facebook at saka sa YouTube. At kayo mga 169 na nanonood ngayon. Plus, plus, plus pa yung mga nasa YouTube at saka sa Facebook. It's time for our mini quiz. I want to, I want to, I want to share your, your opinions. Gusto namin malaman ng inyong mga saluogan. You may now start answering the Slido poll on your screen. Simply go to Slido. Ayan na ko. Ang bibilis naman ng mga anagad. Super good na kaagad. The first question is actually a word cloud. Ito yung tanong. What do you think will make Philippine communication and media education internationally competitive in an AI-powered future. Ano ang dapat gawin ng industriya o ng sektor ng Philippine Communication and Media Education para maging internationally competitive tayo ngayong may AI revolution na ayan o, ngayon pa lang ang dami ng sumagot may mga nakikita ko ang, kung nakikita ninyo yung malaking world yun yung ibig sabihin maraming mga tao ang sumagot ng ganitong mga world adaptability and innovativeness yan support nandyan din yung platforms on Understand AI and include it in our curriculum. Flexibility, policy, research, guidelines, creativity, collaboration, nandiyan din. So just continue answering um, our slide uh, poll. 
Kasi mamaya sa panel discussion natin, baka magbago pa ito. Bukod sa ating web cloud, meron din tayo multiple choice questions. Ayan. Ang first question is, what do you think must be the priority in order to establish the basic conditions to integrate AI in communication and media education? Meron po tayong iba't ibang mga, mga choices. Build infrastructure to support stable internet connectivity. Increase AI competencies of teachers and their faculty. Awareness on AI ethics. Set up AI regulation. Update curricula to include AI courses. Develop AI policy in educational institutions. And ensure quality and inclusive data systems. Alam mo kung ito lahat importante ito. Pero ang tanong, ano yung dapat natin ipayon? And based on our survey so far, ang nangunguna, really importante daw ang awareness on AI ethics. Ito ang dapat daw na i-prioritize. I realize this kasi nung na-introduce itong, nung naging talagang buzzword at ng AI, nung hindi ko natakot na, hindi ko baka gamitin ito sa mali, baka mamaw mawala na tayo ng trabaho, baka mamaw hindi natin hawa kung itong bagong technology na ito. So your ethics is very, very important. So based on our slide ito at the moment, Awareness on AI ethics is the most important. Dapat daw natin i-prioritize to establish the basic conditions to integrate AI in communication and media education. Sagot lang sa ng sagot ko, pwede pa po magbago ito. Our next question, our last multiple choice question, do you think that with AI, the world will achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030? Yes or no now? And whoa, 80% so far of our respondents, of our viewers, answered yes. Sa palagay nila, the world will achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030 with the use of AI. That's very positive. So we will leave our slide open by running in the background to give our viewers more time to answer. Hindi lang po ang mga views natin sa slide wall ang gusto natin mapakinggan ng opinion. Prior to prior to this program, nagsagawa po ng personal on the street interviews ang TVUP. Ang tanong sa ating mga persons on the street, how do you think AI will increase or decrease the digital and social divide in third world countries? The next question, what do you think are the effects of AI in our everyday lives? Let's watch this. So, kahit malaki may internet, hindi nagamit. I think I could also increase togetherness as well as it could um in this kind of social divide. I think AI is powerful to do. Like, uh, we've seen during the pandemic um, how we use AI in order to be a technology person. Eventually, we will be together. Uh, sources of technology can be provided among remote areas. Um, there is a possibility of providing and creating access to quality education as well. So, Ang epekto nito, yun sa atin. Now, we do not close the students, the educators, um, mga companies and agencies na nagkamagamit na ng artificial intelligence tools. Yes. Kagaan ang buhay, you know, mag-apakit ka na lang. Talagang lahat manual. That's the advantage of artificial intelligence. So as a student, I find that our research and digital assistance in we have some information. It's I mean it's happening already. 
increasing uh, con convenience, uh, like um, Siri and Alexa and all of these um, smaller, um, smaller scale APIs. Uh, it, gets, it makes things easier. Like you don't have to type everything. You can just say. Yeah. I think in terms of everyday, you know, usage for social media, I think it would be hard to distinguish whether it's AI generated or not. It's, you know, we are really good at um, seeing them. So I guess we should also try to communicate to people how to distinguish those, um, particularly in social media, since not everyone, I guess, in the community as well knows that AI exists. Right now, maybe we don't see it as often, but many there are a few that many not that many yet but a uh, uh, few features in our uh, daily lives that may have been already uh influenced by AI. No? Uh, so maybe there are already businesses using uh, AI technology. I think that is also very um, interesting to understand like who are we trusted? Like, who are the people behind this? Who are the makers behind this um, that would dictate you whether you move or not? Are they correct? Do they trust that? Maraming salamat sa TVP for producing that a person on the street interviews. Um, very interesting yung, yung, yung mga insights ng, ng mga tao. We are all in agreement na, na you, with AI, gagaan talaga ang buhay. It's very helpful, it's very convenient. Pero ang sabi namin na doon, before we talk about AI and other new technologies, dapat hindi natin kakalimutan yung pinakabuod ng problema dito sa Pilipinas, yung disparity of access to information. Paano nga ba natin ginagamit ang internet, pati yung quality of education in the Philippines? Sinabi rin nila doon na while AI is helpful, while it is exciting, while it is innovative, may mga fears pa rin eh doon sa mga sinabi nila kanina, should I trust the people behind these technologies? Yun yung tanong, how will this impact in our work? How will this impact our work, our jobs? Marawalan ba kami ng trabaho dito? And how will this, will this affect the way we do or we conduct our jobs? So lalo may pros and cons pagdating sa, sa bagong teknolohiya, lalo na sa AI. All right. At hopefully with our discussion this afternoon talagang mas lumawak pa yung pangunawa natin sa AI at mas maintindihan pa natin ito. Now it's time to bring in the big guns for the International Symposium on AI. We have a distinguished panel of keynote speakers for this hybrid webinar. But before we begin, may I just announce that for our on-site um, audience, there are index cards on the, on the tables. This will be collected by our staff. Pwede niyo po dyan isulat ang inyong mga tanong. And for our viewers via Zoom, kindly use, wag po yung chat box ha. Ang gamitin niyo po ay yung Q&A box and upvote the questions that you want me to ask our panelists later on. And finally, for our viewers on YouTube and Facebook, monitor po namin ang inyong mga questions. Just type in your questions in the comments section. Um, yung mga pare-parehong questions, the similar questions, will be clustered together in the interest of time. So, sana po, kung meron na kayong mga tanong na yun, isulat nyo na po yung mga questions na iyan. To start off, our uh, keynote speakers, let me introduce to you our first keynote speakers. We are very pleased to have with us from UNESCO Regional Bureau Office in Bangkok, the advisor and chief of the unit for communication and information. He covers the following countries, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, the Pop Democratic Republic, Singapore, Vietnam, and Cambodia focusing on the areas of safety of journalists, press freedom, digital innovation and transformation, documentary heritage, 
open educational resources, media and information literacy, indigenous languages, and media development. He also has extensive experience on AI policy and internet governance. We are so honored to have with us, please give him a, virtu give him a virtual welcome, Mr. Joe Hironaka. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting UNESCO to engage. And I really want to throw attention back to the organizers for addressing this, uh, this timely subject. So thank you to Dr. Elena and the moderator for an excellent framing and to Rika and all PCS colleagues and partners uh, for organizing this webinar series. Uh, AI and journalism education are topics of direct interest to UNESCO Secretariat. And we want to partner and engage well with uh, these professional communities by listening to you uh, in the Philippines. Um, so by way of introduction, I, I've been introduced, so I won't go much further, but my name is Joe. I administer the Communication and Information Unit in the UNESCO Regional Office in Bangkok. Um, and uh, we cover a, a number of areas, I, and, um, from press freedom to access to information to digital transformation, including AI. Um, and the Philippines is a very valuable member state of UNESCO. Um, I should point out that I have a colleague um, based in UNESCO regional office in Jakarta, which is the UNESCO office actually responsible for Philippines. And her name is Anna Lamtadze. She's already been to the Philippines several times uh, within the past year, and I encourage you to reach out to her just in case um, you haven't yet. Uh, but I'm very pleased to join you today, and I encourage you to reach out uh, in the future. And I should mention, um, I guess as an aside, that I have been to the Philippines more than 20 times. Uh, my wife, Cheryl, is, is uh, Filipina. Uh, the division of UNESCO that I used to uh, that I work for used to be called the Knowledge Societies Division. And, and I think what makes today's topic so, so resonant is that journalists are knowledge workers, yeah? Knowledge is your human capital within the 21st century knowledge economy. Uh, not even to mention how valuable journalists are in holding the line for democracy, for human rights, including freedom of expression and universal access to information. And yet, Journalists, like, like many other knowledge workers, are not at all immune to the disruptions caused by AI. According to Goldman Sachs, roughly two thirds of workers, even in the US and Europe, uh, risk uh, degrees of automation. And journalism is a hard enough uh, profession as it is. Uh, disruptions from social media, uh, even before AI, are one of, are one of so many uh, uh, often existential threats. Online and offline harassment, particularly of women journalists, according to a UNESCO study last year, uh, three quarters of women journalists posed have faced uh, harassment, whether it's online or, or offline, offline meaning in, in, in your face. And, and roughly 10% of murders of journalists in this decade have been women journalists, which is a record high. So, um, Whenever AI is introduced to your organizations amid all the job losses you see, um, at least some of you may be wondering, so what's next? And the theory of the case, the, the positive case, is that AI, including generative AI, will accomplish many newsroom tasks, reduce workloads for journalists, and really help newsrooms to focus on more in-depth and investigative reporting and there are many other applications of AI in the, news, in the newsroom as well. And assuming for now that this is, this is valid, this still raises some basic questions for journalism educators. Uh, you, don't, you don't become Seymour Hirsch or Carl Bernstein overnight. You don't become Maria Ressa overnight. Uh, if, if investigative reporting or experienced news editing are one of the few human-based uh, roles in some newsrooms of the future, how do you jump from journalism school to, to gaining that level of competence? There's a learning curve, obviously, along the way. 
And I have, you know, I have friends from school who joined local newspapers and covered local and metro news sometimes for years. And covering these daily news requires, you know, um, like a self-development, a measure of empathy and ethics and self-awareness of one's biases, like reporting on crime, like drugs, learning how to gather facts and evaluate sources and so on. Um, even how to organize your facts and clean up your, your writing style. Traditional media often have a quite clearly identifiable style of writing and reporting, which is part of their identity, part of their IP, their intellectual property, if you will. And as I think many of you will also remark uh, um, uh, over the next two hours, um, Financial Times and others have reported last week that news organizations are having a, a dialogue with internet companies about licensing access to their content, kind of a yearly revenue model in, in exchange for allowing chat GPT type of access. Uh, and this is an issue of, my, of media viability, first of all, survivability, but also of copyright infringement that generative AI risks having uh, when your training set is really the content of the internet itself. Uh, so in some sense, uh, generative AI may actually force open a sustainable revenue and licensing model um, that did not exist before, it could not exist before. The web 2.0 era um, has had devastating consequences as far as shifting ad revenue to internet companies and away from traditional media. And pre sort of chat GPT, inter internet companies could say they merely are pointing people to news content on our sites while capturing ad revenue along the way. But now GPT is doing something more. It's inadvertently maybe infringing on, con on content uh, copyright while, while also cutting out the news media entirely for many users who just want to read the, what GPT provides, which is a, which is a synthesis. So I have um, three prompts. Um, for our discussion. These are just three suggestions uh, for further debate during this uh, webinar. Um, the first kind of prosaic observation is that journalism education for this generation ought to include hands-on working with AI tools. Students should develop a competence and sense of agency in relation to mastering and integrating these, these newsroom tools. Um, and it's important for journalists to have more than just an abstract sense of what AI can and can't do and where human quality control is needed with AI in the newsroom. And that, that curricula needs to exist uh, in the Philippines. And this is all obviously an area, area of journalism education where UNESCO works. Secondly, uh, training on ethics will be more important than before, both in terms of traditional media ethical standards, which risks erosion in so many uh, competing forms of citizen journalism and so forth, and training as well on the ethical uses of AI itself. Um, I, I alluded earlier that ethical awareness and professional standards are really learned through doing, and maybe the next generation of journalists may skip some of those uh, formative steps working up the ladder as mid-career roles sort of hollow out or are replaced, displaced. And that's just kind of a conjecture, but um, the career development progression is likely to be somewhat different than before and involve more engagement and more mastery of, of technology. And the, the other key ethical component is understanding the ethical uses of artificial intelligence across all fields um, and all professions that you report upon, not just, not just how it impacts journalism. And UNESCO has some tools for journalism education, which I will share with you on the screen if, um, if time allows. Um, third and final point or prompt is how language diversity can expand readership. With AI, with um, natural language processing, there's, there's no reason that any news should be siloed by its language. Yeah? Le Monde, for instance, has a full English daily edition, despite reportedly just seven people working on it. Um, and their job is to make sure machine translations are accurate, contextualized, uh, preserve the ed editorial style that people tend to identify with Le Monde. Um, and meanwhile, um, there are more than 7,000 languages in the world, according to the UNESCO Observatory of Languages. And as many as three or 4,000 of them 
can be expressed in a written form, and yet uh, they're facing extinct extinction, like imminent extinction um, within this century. Um, and what the evolution of technology suggests in practical terms is that bilingual media professionals, including speakers of ethnic minority languages, should be cultivated and encouraged by, by, by journalism schools and by media companies, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it can expand readership and audience and improve the quality and inclusiveness of reporting. So now, um, uh, every, every speech has this sort of boring part where the speaker talks about all the valuable work that their UN organization does, and in this case, what UNESCO does. And this is always very interesting to the speaker, and hopefully it will be to you as well, but it'll be short, and I will try to um, share my, my deck. Um, one moment. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna I, I'm gonna skip the first slide. Um, or what I will just say is that UNESCO last year developed the world's first normative instrument on the ethics of, of AI, and the European Union just yesterday announced millions of euro to support less developed countries to adopt this instrument into national legislation that addresses the, the ethical use of artificial intelligence. And already some 30 countries are working in that direction. Uh, and this year, UNESCO, the division I work for, began drafting global guidelines for regulating social media uh, to safeguard freedom of expression and access to information. And this will be directly relevant to independent media viability and sustainability, areas where uh, many people in this audience uh, work, I believe. And again, Philippines is an important cont contributor to this to this global debate. Um, there's a lot more I can say about media development and safety of journalists for another time. So next slide. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll share this, um, this URL, uh, this link. Um, in the chat so you can actually access it. But um, this publication came out just last month. Um, it's open license like every UNESCO publication, meaning that you can freely adopt it, translate it, remix it, distribute it without any um, any restrictions. And as you can see, it's a handbook for journalism educators um, reporting on, um, on AI. Um, this is a 2022 publication developed by First Draft on behalf of UNESCO through the IBDC, in fact, through um, the UNESCO Bangkok office. And if the title interests you, you are welcome to download it and adapt it, translate it. And again, I'll take that link and share it in the chat. Um, next slide. So, uh, right. So the UNESCO Fake News um, and Disinformation Handbook for Journalism Education and Training um, it was published in 2018, and it's kind of like an international bestseller by UN standards. We have collaborations on 41 language versions, including um, at least 11 Asian languages. And uh, final slide, I think. Um, this is another important uh, work of UNESCO through the, through the UNESCO and ITU Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. And it really presents a compelling and uh, no-nonsense argument that strengthening web freedom and freedom of expression are essential to fighting uh, disinformation. And it may and it has many um, valuable insights and recommendations for the whole panoply of stakeholders um, involved in the dis disinformation cycle. I co organized a webinar last year to launch the full translation in Arabic. And this publication was also cited nine times in a report presented to the European uh, Parliament. Um, so, so yeah, that's 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 it. You, you see um, my email address. I, I can also put that in the chat. And you're welcome to contact me with in areas in any of the areas uh, that may interest you uh, regarding uh, my work and the work of UNESCO. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Joe Renata. Right.
Thank you very much, Mr. Joe Hironaka, Advisor and Chief of UNED for Communication and Information of UNESCO Bangkok. Joe brings up uh, very interesting insights on AI. Sabi niya kanina, AI will reduce the workload of journalists. Yes, that's a plus. But we also have need to address certain issues that, that, that come with it like media survivability and copyright infringement. He mentioned three key suggestions for journalism education. Number one, the importance of including um, training on AI tools in our journalism education. Hindi na natin may kakailan na nandito na yung AI. So we have to include it in our curriculum. We have to teach our students hands-on training on the AI tools. But number two, and more importantly, kundinituro na natin yung ethics in journalism, all the more that it, it's more important na yung may AI na, training on ethics will be really, really more important. And finally, sabi ni Mr. Hironaka, we should, um, we should encourage our students, our journalists, to produce their stories, to tell their stories in their indigenous languages, to cultivate the indigenous languages, because diversity in language can also expand our audience. At mga katulong ang AI dito. So thank you, thank you again very much, uh, Mr. Joe Hironaka. If you have questions for Mr. Hironaka, he will join us again later on in the panel discussion. Now, let's move on to our next keynote speaker. So, nanggali na tayo ng Thailand, punta naman tayo ngayon sa Australia. Our next keynote speaker joins us from the University of New South Wales, Canberra in Australia, where she is a PhD cybersecurity student. She studies the intersections of data, technology, and human rights and delves into digital forensics, disinformation, open source intelligence, tools, and machine learning. Her work in the field of technology and human rights was acknowledged in 2022 when she was awarded by the Women in AI Ethics as one of the top 100 women in artificial intelligence ethics globally. So, saktong-sakto yung susunod nating speaker kasi sinabi kanina ni, ni, ni Mr. Hina, importante ang training in ethics on the world that was this AI revolution. So, perfect yung ating next speaker. Let's all please welcome, live from the University of South Wales, Canberra in Australia, let's all welcome Ms. Jean Lumis Dimpo. Um, thank you, Kara. Thank you, everyone. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respect to the elders past and present and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today, including the numerous indigenous communities in the Philippines, among others. I acknowledge that unjust events and historical wrongs inflicted upon indigenous people, including the widespread theft of their land, suppression of their culture, and systemic marginalization. I also recognize the ongoing struggles and aspirations of indigenous communities all over the world as they continually fight for self-determination, land rights, and the preservation of their unique identities. Well, in this acknowledgement, I want to emphasize the importance of bringing this respect and understanding to the technologies that we create and use, including uh, what we call um, AI. As we navigate the complexities of these technologies, uh, technological landscape, we should do so with an awareness of the potential impacts on all communities, particularly indigenous peoples. And yes, moving on, my name is Jane Linusdinko, and I'm truly privileged to be part of this event today. Uh, they've asked me to share some insights about the role of what people get wrong about AI, especially in the field of media um, education. So to jump right in, I would like to bust the biggest myth about what we call AI, that it truly exists. It's, it does not. Like what um, Katie and Mean Girl say, the limit does not exist, and so does AI. The current understanding of AI is not what AI really means. So, but wait a minute, Jane, doesn't ChatGPT exist? So why is Jean trying to trick us? Well, I promise I'm not messing with you. What we often call AI is really just a fancy way of filling in the blanks or helping with grammar. It's like Grammarly in Adderall. It's called a large language model or LLM, but it cannot genuinely 
think or imagine. Emily Bender came up with a great metaphor for this. She called it a stochastic parrot. So just like a parrot can repeat you in speech without understanding it, LLMs or large, large language models turns out text based on the patterns that they've been trained on without understanding what they're saying. They cannot come up with new ideas, they cannot dream up scenarios, or they cannot even think in abstract, just like what humans do. So they just predict the next likely word based on their training data. And our discussion also highlights how often we tend to project human traits onto technology. You know, we're all guilty of it, assuming that these algorithms are thinking, dreaming, lying, or now even hallucinating. But these are all uniquely human experiences tied to our consciousness, our feelings and our personal experiences. Algorithms do not have feelings or experiences. They don't form beliefs. They don't form intentions. They simply follow the rules that we've coded and their results are based on statistical calculation. So what's important and crucial is that we avoid this tendency to humanize what we call AI because it can distort our understanding of what it is and what it can do. So I'd like to go back to what Laura Dern said in Jurassic Park. She said, you never had control. That's the illusion. I was overwhelmed by the power of this place, but I made a mistake too. I didn't have enough respect for that power and it's out now. When we attribute human characteristics or ability to what we call AI, we often do so under the pretense of having control over these technologies, as if by making them more human. You know, we can predict or determine their actions. But as the what Jurassic Park so vividly demonstrates, believing we can control or fully understand complex systems based on our own experiences and perspective is a massive illusion. When, when we anthropomorphize AI, we're essentially projecting our own human understanding, emotions, and experiences onto non-human entities. We may believe that this gives us a sense of control because we're trying to fit AI into familiar human frameworks. However, this can lead to a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of misinterpretation because it does not think, it does not feel, it does not desire in the way humans do. Its operations are based on coded instructions and statistical models, not by consciousness, not by subjective experience. And by misunderstanding AI's functionality and limits, we risk losing sight of the larger implications of this technology that is happening today. Overhumanizing this type of technology leads us down the wrong path, affecting our policies, how the public sees this technology, and even ethical considerations. You know, it's no secret that companies, startup, venture capitalists can use the hype around AI to attract attention, funding, and business opportunities. You know, I call it AI washing because. It is when a product or a service is portrayed as being driven by advanced technology, even when it does not can seriously cloud the true picture of artificial intelligence. There is no denying the allure that anthropomorphizing AI holds for both media outlets and corporation. And there's a main reason behind this, because it sells. For media outlets, stories that depict AI as human-like or autonomous entities often make for compelling narratives. You know, we appeal to our popular fascination with futuristic sci-fi scenarios, and then we can simplify complex for the general public. And stories like this, you know, stories that thinking, hallucinating, dreaming are much more captivating, and they're much more relatable than dry descriptions of algorithm and computational processes. And as a scientist myself, I know that's a fact. That's why we struggle to, to, to connect with people to understand what climate change is or, 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 or what other, other scientific um, um, uh, um, innovations are. You know? We tap or they tap into established narratives of technology either as a savior or as a threat black and white generating both hope and fear and this leads to of course more clicks more views and higher engagements which are crucial in the digital media landscape and on the corporate side anthropomorphizing ai serves multiple purposes for one it can make ai technology seem more advanced and innovative helping companies stand out in a competitive market it can also make ai more relatable and less intimidating to consumer 
For instance, AI assistants that you're probably having your phone are often presented with human-like qualities to make them more approachable, make them more user-friendly. And this, of course, boosts consumer engagement, customer engagement, and product adoption. But portraying this kind of technology as autonomous can serve to deflect accountability. If this kind of technology is seen as making decisions on its own, it's easier for companies to distance themselves away from the negative outcomes. This can be particularly handy when dealing with controversial issues like algorithmic bias or data privacy. Regulations treating AI as an autonomous entity will overlook the responsibility of the humans, developers and the users behind it. And here's the real kicker. Our fixation on AI and AI ethics can take our eyes off more important economic and political issue. AI technology is not developed or used in a bubble. It's not in a vacuum. It's deeply interwoven within uh, a wider systems of power, economic relations, and resource consumption. For example, the concentration of power and influence within few large technological companies that control both AI technology and the vast amount of data that they use can worsen existing power imbalances. The adoption of these technologies potentially automate many jobs, possibly leading to a wider gap between the rich and the poor. Also, profits from AI technologies, as we know today, only or mostly go to the companies and investors that develop and deploy this technology, contributing to further economic inequality. And I will not even go to the environmental impact of ChatGPT. You know, these technologies, especially those based on machine learning, need massive amount of computational power and water, and therefore energy. And this can lead to increased energy consumption, carbon emissions, posing a serious threat of challenge to environmental impacts are often overlooked in this discussion. Focusing too much on naming it AI can distract from broader socioeconomic system and structures that shape how these technologies are developed and used. Issues like market concentration, regulatory policies, labor rights, and access to technologies are all key to understanding the impact of this technology. And so while AI and ethics are more important, are also important discussions, we also need to remember that this kind of technologies are a part of and have an impact on wider systems of power, economic relations, and resource consumption. So a comprehensive understanding and critique of these technologies might, must take these broader issues into account. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Alamia, it's easy to feel intimidated by new technology. Uh, so, like artificial intelligence, it's easy to, to feel fear and feel intimidated and overwhelmed. But, but thank you very much, Jim and Ms. Binko, for, for that very inspiring, um, that very enlightening um, speech. She started it by saying AI does not exist. <laughs> it does not exist. I, this abuse na natin yung, yung, yung sa utak natin, yung abuse natin na AI will take over our lives. <laughs> diba? um, tama yung sinabi ni Jim eh. Let us not humanize it. Let us not, let us not think that AI can, can take over the world. It is basically just a tool. It's not a human person. It's not, it cannot come up with ideas, sabi ni Jean. It cannot come up with new ideas. It does not have feelings. It simply follows rules, calculations, and coded instructions. At the end of the day, it is just a tool. And tayo pa rin ang magkocontrol dito. So, the, the main point of Jean is we should understand the complexities of this technology so that we know how to use it. Huwag na natin para hindi rin tayo matakot. So, ang tanong, paano nga ba natin gagamitin itong tool na ito, itong um, AI na ito? After, after listening to our first two speakers, um, telling us about how, how AI is, um, is shaping our, our lives, 
Let's bring the concept to Hong Kong and the Philippines. Our next keynote speaker is the founder and chief technology officer of Zero Analytics, a social impact data analytics company. Co-founder Din Shan of Data Ethics PH, an online community focused on social issues such as data privacy, data security, AI-driven discrimination, data liabilities, data ownership rights, and data poverty. He also co-founded the Analytics Association of the Philippines and is a board of trustees and member of the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. Lawakan pa natin ang ating pangunawa sa artificial intelligence. Let's all give a warm welcome to Mr. Dominic Ligot. Thanks for the kind intro, Kara. You got my slides? So I was asked to talk about data journalism. But I felt compelled to add a slide after the previous talk. It's chill. How many of you know the word maximalist? Probably an alien word because we're used to minimalism. So maximalism is uh, actually an art technique. So I asked uh, one uh, an AI image generator, show me journalist maximalism. And that's what it looks like. Here's another one. So the, the AI tool I used was Midjourney, which is one of the most popular, or well, probably the best at the moment, AI uh, image generator. If you look at these four photos, at least for me, one of the first things that I realized is that this AI is a little biased. I did not say any gender, but in its infinite wisdom, it considers at least three out of the four images. When you say journalism, it's a man. Yeah, more on that later. So I'm going to talk about generative journalism. Uh, I'll break my talk into kind of four main parts. I want to jump off from the previous talk about just coming to grips with what we really mean by AI today. And then I'll go through specific use cases of how AI is actually being used in journalism already. And finally, uh, I think everyone loves the doom and gloom. So I'll come back to that also. So chill muna and then later we can go back to doom and gloom. First things first. Uh, AI is not a new term. It's been around for a while, but I think the main term we're talking about now is generative uh, AIs. What does that mean? Up, up until recently, when people said AI, they meant discriminative AI, meaning this is AI that takes data and then gives you some sort of a conclusion or an outcome. So it interprets data. Now, AI does sort of the opposite. You give it data and then it generates more data. So for example, in the discriminative era, you give a picture of a cat, AI will tell you that's a cat or not a cat, depending on the photo. Now you give a photo of a cat, the AI will create more cats, or you give it the word cat, and then it will create cats. So this is the AI I wanna focus on today. This is also what's driving a lot of the interest. And I guess the, the, I guess the doom and gloom, so we're either talking about uh, generative AI in the form of deepfakes or image generation like the journey, or of course the ubiquitous chatbots now like ChatGPT, Bard, and all of these things. First thing I want to preface is uh, I think OpenAI's fault, I think, made a mistake by likening chatbots to search engines. I think it is a wrong approach because unlike search engines, chatbots do not extract data from a database. So they actually create data from scratch based on patterns it remembers. And the problem here is those patterns may not be accurate. Well, they're accurate statistically, but they may not be factual. So that's the first thing to remember about the risks here. However, they perform very well when you give it existing data that you're already familiar with, data that you're vetted with, and then they interpret it. So that's essentially the bottom line of AI currently being used today, in, especially in journalism, AI is being used for content creation, for content analysis, and creating interactive content. I'll focus on these three things, but you see how, how practical it is. First, in terms of content creation, this presentation actually was half generated by AI. So I asked 
ChatGPT, can you give me a 10 slide outline for generative AI in journalism? And that's what you've got. That's what I have here. That doesn't mean I, I trust it. At least it helped me organize my thoughts because I have a very strict 15 minute deadline. So I trust AI did my work for me. One of the most compelling uses of content creation is how AI can help create very complex content from seemingly a little prompt. So this is an interesting app called Learning Studio AI. It basically creates a full course, an online course. So I give it a prompt. Uh, can you give me a course on using generative AI in classrooms? And after 90 seconds, it's a full course with chapters, with quizzes. Uh, and I think this is a shout out. I'm, I'm, I'm an academic as well. One of the biggest problems we have in education, not to mention media education, is the administrative load we have on our teachers. And we expect them to produce papers and teach. So this is an opportunity for AI to come in. So never mind students cheating in their essays. You know, that's another issue. But uh, teachers can speed up the creation time for their content. Analysis is a big deal. This is already a day-to-day a -day task for me. Rather than reading articles in total, I actually ask ChatGPT, can you summarize this article for me in five bullets? And if you're in a newsroom or in a, in a fast-paced environment, you can't afford to be reading everything end-to-end. -end. This is a great shorthand. So this is what I was saying. Rather than relying on chatbots to create uh, original uh, material, which might be factually wrong, Using them to summarize existing material, 100%, really reliable. Here's an interesting one. This is a recent article on the Amazon uh, layoffs, and there was a strike. So it, it was a lengthy article, so Wired didn't have time to read it. So I said, can you summarize this text? Just copied it, put it in the chatbot. But then I gave it some bullets, basically the seven elements of story, you know, as it's taught. Give me the plot, give me the tone, give me the scene, give me the setting, the conflict, the characters, the POV. And, you know, in one click, you got it. So whether you want to focus on what was the central theme, the conflict of the article, who's the point of view, this can really speed up a lot of uh, productivity for people who want to, you know, just get on with the, the task at hand. Finally, I find this probably one of the most compelling uses, very mundane, but I don't know if you've heard of chat PDF. You know, it's a variant built on chat GBT. You just upload the PDF and you can talk to the PDF, basically. So here's an existing example. Are you familiar with the poem, this is the data, you know, classically among the blah, blah, blah. So I uploaded it. And then I started asking this is the data, you know, I'm sad. Can you give me you know, advice? And it gives me advice based on the poem. Or, hey, I'm going to be speaking in front of some journalists. What should I do to stay uh, calm and stable and, you know, uh, credible? advice based on the poem. So you can use this for research papers. You can use this for articles. And sometimes it aids. It's better to be conversational with material as opposed to you know reading it straight. Like I can't read articles straight without falling asleep after thirty minutes. No, but talking to a chatbot based on the, an article is really uh, useful. So where is this headed? This, this technology will not stop here. This is some of the stuff I've seen. I haven't checked all of them. There's a website called, there's an AI for that. So just take note of that. It's an AI that recommends AI. And they said, there's an AI for that. Give me AIs related to journalism. And here are the top four. So there's generative press. These are chatbots basically writing articles from Twitter posts. There's news writer, which is an automated press release writer. You just give the situation, what you want to highlight, instant article. Uh, TLDR is an aggregator site. This summarizes all of the articles by category, so you can choose what theme you want. And then on the lower right, probably the beginnings of it, I'm not sure if it works as well yet. How can you, how can you use AI to vet fake news? So this is an AI that ranks the trustworthiness of an article. No? So more on that later. So given all of these rather mundane, no, but very practical things, the promise of generative AI, I'll be positive with that for a change, productivity. You know, newsrooms are challenged, educators are challenged, and the only way you can alleviate that is a plus. Customization is another. Sometimes you need to write the same story, but under different angles, perspectives, AI can help with that. Research and development also, avoiding the trap of using AI like a, a search engine. You use it in conjunction with a search engine or you use it in conjunction with research. And then finally, I think the name of the game now is really content creation. Everyone is challenged to produce content day in, day out, 24 hours. 
I found I'm actually quite active on social media now up until just up until recently, you know, last month and a half, I've been producing webinars. AI has been an instrumental part of my content creation, you no, know, and helped me kind of produce all the content I want, of course, within certain guidelines. Okay, so good. So now let's look at the challenges again. You know? And I want to focus on the practical challenges, like the near-term ones, because these are the things that will probably hit you the moment you start uh, talking about AI. Uh, there's three. One is safety. Of course, copyright is another. And of course, the bug there is disinformation. On the safety front, even before generative AI, we have been challenged by basically automated tools going uh, bonkers now. Like, I'm sure you've used Waze. So Waze for me is an essential tool. It helped me uh, get to Diliman from Pasig in 15 minutes. But the use of Waze can be unreliable. Like in these uh, two cases, where the, the users of Waze, basically Israelis, led, Waze led them to a Palestinian camp unknowingly, and they got killed. No? Or in Brazil, this is Lumantus na, um, a couple were vacationing in Rio de Janeiro, they misspelled the destination on Waze, and instead of a resort, they ended up in a slum, and there was a gang war, they got shot. So is that the, is that the fault of Waze? I don't know. It's definitely a data issue, and this is now something we need to be wary of. The AI tools are only as good as the, as the data that's fed to them. So it's now a data quality becomes a social issue. Of course, we're not strangers to social media, and I'm sure everyone will agree it's so polarized today. Like, parang it's, you know, DDS versus Loyalista versus whoever. There's a reason for this. Social media is a marketing tool. And number one in marketing is to segment audiences. So inadvertently, the polarization you see is actually a direct result of this segmentation mechanism. The algorithm wants us to be warring against each other because marketers want to target you for preferences. They just didn't realize that hate speech and genocide was a very effective uh, no, segmentation tool. And then something as uh, mundane as facial recognition, this was uh, two cases in the UK uh, where passports couldn't be obtained by ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities. Why? Because the facial recognition system was trained on the hands. So see, Richard Lee couldn't get a passport because the algorithm thought his eyes were closed. And see, Joshua Bad couldn't get a passport because the algorithm thought his mouth was wide open. But the bottom line was, just couldn't read their faces properly. So this issue of misclassification, it's still there. Of course, researchers try their best to, uh, have you seen this? Poppy or, no, Chihuahua or Raisin Bread and Poppy or Bagel. It is a reality. And we're not trained to work with tools that have a probability of error. Like, would you deal with a refrigerator that has a 0.1% chance of heating your food instead of cooling it? No, uh, we're not used to that. But that's how AI works. This is a little more abstract. This is what people everywhere worry about. Whenever you automate a system, there's a chance the system doesn't understand what you want it to do. So this is an example of an AI uh, agent playing a game, and it was given a task, maximize the score. It's actually a bird going around a racetrack. And what it figured out was the best way to maximize the score was never to finish the course, but to keep picking up the bonus items. So it didn't accomplish what the modelers want, but it accomplished the goal. No? The abstract one I keep talking about is what if you have an AI that runs a hospital and you give it a goal? It's minimize the cases of cancer. And the AI might just say, oh, I'm just going to kill all the cancer patients and minimize cancer. This is a very abstract problem. It's a computer science issue for a long time. But now it's becoming reality because of these tools. The other thing we need to be wary of is how we interact with these tools. We're not used to uh, AI that generates data. Like uh, someone committed suicide talking to a chatbot because chatbot was depressing. Uh, someone married the chatbot. I didn't know that was possible. Uh, you, because uh, she felt, the, the woman who married the chatbot, she felt comforted with the chatbot. She suffered a heartbreak recently, and the chatbot knew exactly what the tell her. Copyright is a kind of a tricky issue now. Because the laws are rather kind of gray. There's law, for example, on derivative works, which you have a copyright on, but the basis for that work should have been licensed. But when you train a model on a work, is that an amount of copying? Question mark. Like in this case, by Getty Images, there's the suing stability AI, 
because clearly this image on the right was inspired by the left. Unfortunately, nasama yung logo ng Getty images on the bottom, little garbled. So that's where it could uh, be tricky, no? And of course, the satire versus disinformation uh, image on the left by then having Ako and Divisoria uh, was generated for fun. But what if you didn't know who Biden was? You would really think he's walking around in Divisoria. And then these images on the right very recently were protests in, in France. Uh, and these uh, images were generated allegedly from that protest, except the glove had six fingers. So you know that that wasn't a true glove. Uh, but the AI is getting better. This is a, an existing exercise we did in our lab a few years ago. Uh, we just got an original video and then superimposed spaces on it. The question here is, we may be at a point where we don't trust video anymore. And that has legal and creative implications. All right, I think I'm near my 1441. 20 seconds. Uh, there, there's a really uh, problem now in the global arena. No one knows or agrees how to regulate this stuff. So in, within one week of each other, Japan said copyright won't be an issue for AI, but the EU released copyright rules. And then Stanford made a kind of a study. If we look at all of the major AI vendors right now, in AI, Google, etc., and then ran them against the EU Act that was recently drafted, how many of them do you think would pass? Zero. No. And in fact, the rules on copyright, you can read this, are one of the most flagrantly ignored, right? So what are the takeaways? Um, chill. And then generative AI can really improve journalism, can really improve education from a productivity and interactivity and research perspective. But we need to come back to bottom line, research ethics, media ethics, journalistic integrity. I'll be the first to tell you, because I kind of have put in both uh, journalism and tech, uh, there's this interesting divide between journalists and technologists. No? Uh, it's just incidental. I think we need to start merging the two fields because journalists use technology a lot. And we cannot wait for regulation. I'll be the first to tell you that. Regularly, I'll tell you what happens when a disaster has already occurred. Like the UN Declaration of Human Rights occurred after World War II. We really want to wait for World War II before we start getting our act together. Probably not. So in summary, uh, we talked about generative AI in journalism, ethical considerations. So we can talk. I just want to shout, uh, please follow me on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. I actually became quite active in social media just about uh, a month and a half ago because it seems like we have a shortage of people talking about AI. So I'm putting out friendly, non-technical content. Uh, every week I have a webinar uh, that I run called AI for Lunch. The episode this Saturday will be about journalism and disinformation. And then I have an open invitation. If you need a speaker, one hour, quick briefing, no cost. I'm happy to oblige face-to-face -face or, you know, or uh, video, TikTok. And then um, I've already done five webinars. So the sixth will be this Saturday. You can find it all on my YouTube channel. And then we will soon be releasing, this is my company, naman. I run an AI company and we do use case design. I think we don't have a shortage of tech uh, implementers and talent. I think we have a shortage of ideas. So if you are interested in your organization, this is agnostic of field and uh, industry. If you need help incubating ideas for AI, more than happy to, to help. So that's my talk. Thank you very much and looking forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Dominic, for your number, no, ha? Sakto, 15 minutes. So, how do you put it on number, no, ma'am, no, ma'am? All right. Hindi ko na alam, parang lunar coaster of emotions na ako. Kanina po nakikinig, parang napaka-hopeful ko na kanina pagkatapos ko pakinggan si Jean. Tapos nung nagsalita si Dominic, hindi ko alam kung mag-chitchin ba ako, natatakot ba ako. Yeah, hindi ko na maibigyan. Kasi sa sinula, parang galing-galing ng AI. Pero on the other hand, shucks, baka may naman ako ng trabaho. Mas magaling nato siya mag-summarize sa akin. <laughs> baka mas magaling din yung drama niya sa akin. Pero very interesting yung sinabi ni Dominic sa atin. Yes, we can use AI. It will increase our productivity. Mas mag-customize natin yung mga storya natin. Matutulungan tayo with research and development and content creation. 
Pero just like any other technology, may challenges po ito. The challenge of safety, copyright, disinformation, and, and bias. Hmm. All right. Pero at the end of the day, dapat mas intindihin natin itong technology na ito para lalo natin siyang magamit to our advantage. We have heard from the industry for our final keynote, let us now hear from the academy. Paano nga ba magagamit ito? itong tool na ito sa media education. We are pleased to have with us a professor from the Department of Information Systems and Computer Science. She is also the head of the Ateneo Laboratory for the Learning Sciences. She specializes in artificial intelligence in education and games in education. In 2021, she was awarded Distinguished Researcher by the Asia Pacific Society for Computers in Education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maria Mercedes T. Rodrigo. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And I hope my slides are showing. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I was very, very interested to listen to the first three speakers and uh I'm coming from a slightly different angle. Uh, my, my area is artificial intelligence and education. And I'm here today to talk about fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics. Um, to those of you who are hearing about AI Ed for the first time, uh, it's the study of learning wherever it occurs. And it specifically looks at how AI is used to create learning environments that are adaptive, flexible, inclusive, personalized, engaging, and effective. So the the, the hope of AI Med is to use AI to really bolster the learning experience, to make our learners learn better, and to make our teachers' jobs easier. Um, so I'm actually one of those people who's very hopeful about AI. And I'm also one of those people who is, part of my hope is to actually see something like chat GPT in our, in our classrooms I and mean, trained on our content, um, assisting teachers with their classes. You know, we hear often enough about class, about teachers who have 45, 50, 90 students in their class. Let's put a few chatbots in there to, to help this teacher out. I'm a great advocate of that. Okay. Um, there are many flavors of AI Ed. It's an Polish field. It's about 30 years old. Um, and for those of us over 30, I'm sorry, that's not a job at us. Um, and it, it has a variety of interests. So we look at things like student modeling, domain modeling. We're interested in not only how students learn, we're also interested in how they feel, uh, what motivates them, and what will get them let's say, unstuck when they are stuck. The conversations about uh, fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics have been around for maybe five years. So the first time I heard of um, a state in AI was about 2018. And um, faith was, was divided into these four categories of so fairness, what do we mean by fairness? And the, the, the first three speakers spoke a little about AI bias. Um, bias is almost inevitable in AI, and I'll talk more about that later. So it, when we talk about fairness, we ask really, what is the, what is the value system that is embodied by the AI whose priorities whose interests are being represented by the AI. And are these interests uh, compatible with morality and with the law, which you know can be two different things. Then accountability. Um, Sir Dominic talked about this a little. Uh, in those cases where we have um, ways where people were actually harmed, uh, is chat uh, is is ways accountable for that? So when an AI makes a mistake, who is it that answers for that mistake? Um, are are you just if you if you were hurt, robbed, killed, 
Huwag naman sana are you just collateral damage or is there somebody who can actually be uh, tried for this? There's transparency. What does transparency mean? The old days of um, the older forms of machine learning, these are, uh, the, the AI was composed of rules. If the score is greater than 93, the student gets an A. Simple rules like that, very easy to interpret. These days of deep learning, the rules are not easy to interpret or understand anymore. And so how a conclusion was derived isn't something that we can tell just by looking at the model. And then finally, there's ethics. So there's issues like beneficence. Who benefits from the AI? Is it fair to all concern? Um, who does it harm? Are there communities that are more harmed or marginalized than others? Um, and so on and so forth. Okay. So there's a lot to discuss, and I, I and I didn't want to drill down into one form, but but I wanted to focus specifically on data. Um, many, most all AI systems are built on data. And data needs to be ethically sourced. So my question was, is it possible to ethically source data in the Philippines? And of course, as I said, I'm coming from an education standpoint. So this is a, probably a small uh, view of, of this particular problem. Um, other types of data that there may be in healthcare, government, et cetera, will have a slightly different view, but I'm coming from education. Okay. Uh, ethically sourced data in the Philippines for education is a challenge. And not just because we have a lot of data. We do actually have a lot of data. That has a lot of data. But the data tends to be siloed. You, know, not, it's not an interview. you don't have an interview with the books, but you have like, a lot of sort of pockets of data. A lot of the data is in, in paper form. And bringing all that data together is, uh, is a challenge. Um, one of the things that, yeah, people were in the early days of, not, not, not so early days, but uh, a few years ago when the hot topic was machine learning, um, people seem to think of machine learning as some kind of magic that you take all this data, you throw it into the machine learning algorithm, and by some miracle of science, um, you get intelligence, Deva. And, 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 and one of the things that I kept talking about back then is it's not like that. It's not that easy. <laughs> because you have to do so much pre-processing before you get to the part where you can actually feed the data into your algorithm. Uh, pre-processing like what? You have to take out the dirty data. You have to take out the inconsistencies. You have to check for, um, for erroneous data. Or, uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to clean all of that. If you don't clean that, then your model will be useless and pointless. Okay, but but beyond that, beyond the fact that we have fragmented data, segmented data, siloed data, dirty data, in the fact, this this there's more to it. Um, I've had the opportunity to to think to to collaborate with uh, with academics abroad. And in, in what are called weird countries, Western, educated, industrialized, democratic, and no, sorry, rich and democratic, weird. Western, industrialized, educated, rich, and democratic, yeah. So I've had, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with them. So people from the US, from the UK, and one of the things I noticed is there's this research asymmetry. So you have international collaborations where there are bilateral agreements. So let's say the U.S. government gives so many dollars to your, to your partner and the Philippine government gives the equivalent amount to the Philippine partners here. Um, unfortunately, you know, what you get for the $10,000 in the U.S. is maybe five hours a week for two or four months. What you get for half a million pesos here is two or three research assistants working full time for the same amount of time. Right? So, but um, it's a lot of asymmetry in how far your money gets you. Also, the demands on Philippine researchers are much more aggressive. Yes, US researchers, UK researchers must publish too, but 
the pressure on the Philippine researchers is much higher because we're playing catch up. The, I noticed my US and UK partners tend to be a little more relaxed, not more chill. <laughs> but the Philippine researchers cannot be so chill. So this creates a very high pressure environment to produce. There's also this asymmetry in race. And my I have a, a, a couple of US partners who were here for a visit and they were talking to each other. They were both right, they were Caucasian, a man and a woman. And the woman asked the man, so did you feel your white privilege? And he said, oh, yes, I felt my white privilege. It was the moment you walk in that classroom, either they're viewed differently, they're, they're more sort of, um, they're a lot more deference. So doors open because of white privilege. Uh, doors that may be a little tougher to walk through if you didn't have, if you were not Caucasian. Okay, then of course there's automatic exclusion, and I believe one of the one of our speakers said this already. Um, if a school doesn't have computers, you can't deploy AI. If you don't have Wi-Fi, a lot of AI is dependent on Wi-Fi. You don't have fast internet, sorry, you're out. Um, so we have schools are in conflict areas, where schools are in remote areas. These are automatically excluded populations. Um, well intentioned as we are, we just can't reach them if they don't have tech. Um, there's, there's also the issue of lax regulatory requirements. Here in the Philippines, getting to schools is actually quite easy, um, especially public schools. If you have a reasonably good relationship with the public schools that you're uh, that you are approaching, and Ateneo has um, a wide network of public schools that we work with. They'll let you in. They'll, 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 you know, you can experiment with your children, and it's okay. You know, um, of course, so, so the, and then partnerships with teachers so it was quite easy as well. And this poses a problem when it comes to things like informed consent. Um, because remember, when you conduct when any kind of data gathering, when you're collecting personal details, and I really do mean sometimes very benign personal details like the age or the gender of the student, that's considered personal information. Um, you need to get informed consent, signed informed consent. But if you are privy, I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room has read the very dire state of our PISA and Tim's uh, standardized test results were, were miserable in the world stage, right? Makes you wonder um, how much of our informed consent forms is actually comprehensible to the teachers and the students. And then, of course, in terms of parents, uh, I'm sorry, principals and teachers, we collect data. And if it's survey data that's easy enough to understand, we can show them the survey form. But the data that we collect, my team collects, is also um, interaction data. So when students actually use the AI system, we collect what interactions they perform, what answers they give, whether the answer was correct or wrong, how long it took them, etc. We disclose that, but how much of it do you actually understand, right? And yeah, it's um, uh, so it colors your your it it brings you to uh, we we don't intend any harm, of course, and these are all educational environments that teach English or math or something like that. But, but yeah, it, it's a question. Then there's finance, the question of financial incentives. So students are given a small financial incentive of 50 pesos uh, for participating in our experiments. But you have 50 pesos to, uh, if you're earning minimum wage or less, that might constitute duress, right? So again, ethics. Okay, and then finally, we have to ask ourselves, where is the benefit? Published papers, we publish a lot. That's all good for point system, uh, our QS rankings, and so on. But seriously, how many people read my papers? <laughs> I mean, Google knows, right? Um, but really what I want beyond just the publication is, really, is for the software to actually make a difference in the learning and the learning experience, in test scores, and how happy our students are in their classrooms. That's what I, that's what I want. But you know, whether that continued use happens is often outside of my control. 
Okay, so just to wrap up, AIM researchers such as myself, we want to do good things. We do. We're well intentioned. Um, but it, it's I, I do often think about the ethics of what we do because I we we try very hard to obey regulatory requirements and data privacy law, etc. But you know, there's always a little bit of fear, I guess, that are we actually taking advantage? Are we overstepping? Is trapping out my location partner actually exerting more the dangerous than they should be? Okay, and this is where I wrap up. Thank you so much for your time and for watching. Marami, marami salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Rodrigo. Thank you. And I think that, that sums up everything that we have been talking about. In any conversation about AI in education, the topic of ethics has always surfaced. Pero ngayon binagdagan ni Dr. Rodrigo yung mga dapat natin ilagay sa utak natin when we talk about technologies like AI. Yung acronym na FATE, F-A-T-E, Fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics. Muli palakpakan po natin. Let's give a warm round of applause to all our keynote speakers. And now we have come to the exciting part, the panel discussion. Ngayon pa lang may mga nakutuhan na akong questions from Zoom, from YouTube, from Facebook, and from our live audience here at PSSC. Um, may we invite our speakers on Zoom, Mr. Joe Hironaka from UNESCO Bangkok and Jean Leonis Dinko from the University of, New University of New South Wales, Canberra to switch on their camera. And for our speakers who are present here at the PSSC Auditorium, to please join us on stage. Dominic Ligot from Cyrenutics, Dr. Didi Rodrigo from Ateneo, and Dr. Nenny Kernia from the University of the Philippines. Ayan. Meron na po akong mga questions na nandatanggap nito. Is Mr. Joe Mitnaka? Yeah, yeah, I can see them. All right. So this is a question for Mr. Hironaka. This is a question from Zoom from Wilson Pavilion. So, Joe, what are some of the important recommendations that UNESCO could give to government and non-government policymakers regarding the safety and privacy issues related to AI at the present? Can you hear me? Uh, hello. Uh, I'd appreciate if I could read in writing. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't understand it. It was garbled. I'm afraid. Sorry, I will repeat the question, sir. This is from Mr. Padillon via Zoom. What are some of the important recommendations that UNESCO could give to government and non-government organizations, uh, NGO policymakers, regarding the safety and privacy issues related to AI at the present? Important recommendations for policy mem policy makers regarding AI and data privacy issues. Um, th th thank you. I'm going to um, uh, interpret what I heard from uh, what I think I understood, which is um, uh, what practical tools we have um, to. Well, this is my interpretation to ensure that the uh, normative instrument, a normative instrument is um, is an international law or framework adopted by the 193 member states of UNESCO. Um, and there is one for the ethics of AI. Yeah. And uh, within that um, framework, it, there are a number of mechanisms um, to support um, uh, the application the, you know the the transfer of 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 these recommendations into national legislation. As I as I think I said, there are around thirty countries already working on that. And and one way to think about um, a UNESCO recommendation is um, at some level like a in this is kind of UN trivia, uh, but but at some level a recommendation is is. Um, uh, a higher level than a declaration, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The reason that the Universal Declaration um, is 
so considered so powerful is because it was um, turned into national legislations in virtually all countries. So that's that's the ultimate um, goal. Um, in terms of the elaboration of these frameworks, um, very much it's the NGOs and CSOs and other partners that are involved. And in a similar way, the guidelines for social media, uh, which um, uh, my colleagues are working very closely on, uh, we circulated three three versions. We received tens of thousands, I think, of, of, of feedback. Um, and I see constantly in my email, um, um, you know, um, uh, specific uh, requests and petitions from different NGOs in this region and so on. So uh, th those are uh, those are by nature what UNESCO does as a convening organization of the UN on these matters. Um, something we take uh, on, on board. It's extremely valuable. Um, I think the comments on the social media guidelines um, have closed uh, actually yesterday. Um, I don't know if I don't know if there are other ways to to influence the process, but I, I, I strongly encourage every concerned NGO to really engage with UNESCO's intergovernmental processes. It is possible. Um, I hope I didn't miss the point of the question, or I wasn't trying to dodge it. I, I really couldn't quite understand what um, um, what was being asked. Thank you very much. Um, and maybe our panel would like to add to that. Um, kasi yung din yung sa slide po ng results natin na, na kailangan i-prioritize natin yung awareness on AI ethics. Ano pa sa tingin ninyo yung mga um, recommendations na kailangan para sa mga policy makers natin para mas ma-insure yung safety, um, lalo na yung may privacy issues tayo related to AI and the process. Sige, Doc. I can add. Hello. Yeah, okay. it's working. Um, see, uh, Professor Hilo mentioned already that there are existing laws. Uh, Data Privacy Act is one, RA 10173. There's also the Cybercrime Prevention Act, the RA 10175. Uh, and it's already provide for you know redress. No, if you have uh, issues, I think the the problem is uh, wide awareness amongst. For people who had their their Facebook thing hacked, many of them don't know that you can really go to the police and report it. Mm -hmm. Or uh, like I, I personally experienced uh, an identity theft uh, recently. You know, a training provider used my face to sell their training courses, and we're escalating that first to the privacy commission and also as a cybercrime. That's one. Um, the, 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 I think the, the broader issue now is, okay, beyond that, I say, well, there's no a mention of AI in either of those laws. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, now we need to have, I, I think, a, a very explicit dialogue with lawmakers. There's actually three bills being ano, uh, proposed right now. Senator Marcos wants to propose a bill on jobs. C. Salceda wants to propose a bill on copyright. And C. Barbers wants an AI agency. I think my, my first recommendation there is please consult academia please consult private sector don't don't regulate in a bubble i'm not saying they they are um, and then finally you can also get inspired by existing structures like uh, the privacy act has this thing called the privacy impact assessment it's not a requirement but if you're going to procure let's say data systems uh, it's almost always a requirement already not so much to Parang restrict, but at least if something blows up, you have accountability. Who signed this thing and who cleared it? And then uh, at the same time, there's these things called the ISO standards. So it's not so much uh, parang a punishment, but more of a, a standard. Now, okay, if you want to implement good quality systems, you have to comply with ISO 9000. And that also becomes a procurement requirement. We don't have that for AI right now. But okay. something, something could be done to that. So, so in other words, um, Sir Dominic, um, like what Sir Joe said a while ago, that the um, social media guidelines, guidelines of, um, so as far as social media is concerned, and this can be applied also to AI. Yung nga lang, at least here in the Philippines, we have already laws in place. It's just that hindi lang nakasulat black and white that this, could, that this is AI related, but it could be used also for 
for AI technologies. Yes, Dr. Perna. Uh, yes, and in addition, and this is where the academe, as well as associations like the PCS and other uh, you know, uh, academic and uh, professional organizations come into play, is to work with these uh, policymakers, you know, mm -hmm. in fact, educate them and educate the public about, you know, how, uh, what exists, what guidelines, uh, mm -hmm. what, what other uh, potential areas you know, uh, should be included when it comes to policy and lawmaking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another question for, for Jean. Jean, are you still there? Um, the question is from Zoom, um, from uh, Josefina Lakai. The question is, what measures can, could be adopted or implemented for AI not to be abused? Are you there, Jean? Hello, hello. Hi, Jean. This is a question for you. Um, what measures, this is from Zoom, one of our Zoom viewers, Josefina Lakai. She's asking what measures could be adopted or implemented for AI not to be abused? Uh, great. Uh, thank you. So I'd first I'd like to acknowledge that while AI definitely can bring about significant benefits, especially in sectors like public services, you know, healthcare, there's one question about healthcare a while ago and education, there is also a risk of a lot of misuse and abuse. And that's a good question considering that there's a lot of things happening at the moment. First, um, I think um, Dr. Ligut mentioned um, a while ago that there is a, a need for transparency. You know, AIs or the systems that we have now should operate transparently with clear explanations of how decisions are made. But most of the time it's open just, you know, they just go back to us and say that it's a block box. And this is essentially for trust and accountability, especially when technology like this is used in high stakes areas like healthcare or law enforcement, where, mm. you know, you police um, certain uh, communities because training data suggests that most of the crimes happen there. And that's not fair, and that's very discriminatory. And uh, th these technologies also should not be should not reinforce or, or exacerbate existing biases or inequalities. So there's a lot of measures that could be done, including audits, diverse or representative training data, and the involvement of diverse stakeholders in in AI development and, and deployment. And there's another two that I would like to pinpoint, which I mentioned a while ago, is accountability. You know, if something goes wrong with the system, there's no clear policy on who should be responsible. And this could involve a lot of legal and regulatory measures to ensure accountability for both the developer and the users. And then the human oversights to ensure that the systems do not operate beyond human control, there should be provisions for meaningful human oversights and the ability to intervene and override um, systems when necessary. You know, we are always very, very quick to jump into this kind of scenarios and say that, oh, we're gonna be removing humans on the loop because we don't need them and whatnot and so whatsoever. But then when things um, go uh, astray, you'll, you'll see that <laughs> most of the things could have prevented if there's actually human um, on the loop. Yeah, right. Thank you, Jean. Um, so, um, meron din tanong dito, um, kasi we're now talking about um, AI being abused by certain sectors. So, but in actually, yung mga questions dito, na, ito yung sinasabi ni Don kanina na may um, may tanong din dito, Don, para sa'yo, how do you see AI being recognized against journalists and being used for political operations? Yeah, so obviously the content creation is prone to abuse. And I think I'll be the first to say, while you can use AI to generate content, uh, the practice of using AI to kind of detect bad content or, or fake content, it's still an emerging practice. Uh, there's no perfect solution yet. So that's the first area where journalists need to be careful because you can literally ask a chatbot, please write this article in the style of Cara David and then use Cara David's deepfake. And then now it's your, your word against the, the digital Cara David's word. No? That's, that's a problem. 
And we're, and we're not only talking about written content. I didn't demo earlier. There's already voice AI. There's video AI uh, that's, that can clone your voice. So I think we're, okay, um, what do we do now? I understand why you can say You can say chill. You can say you chill, chill. And it's like, chill. And then, <laughs> Okay, see, I'll, I'll try to attack it first philosophically. Um, when we say ethics, it doesn't mean follow the law lang. Because mm -hmm. the law happens when disasters occur and then the lawmakers figure out something. Ethics is proactive. We need to teach right. that in school. We do the right thing. Right. Yeah, Raise yourselves. Um, right. So, yeah, baseline. And then moving on top of that. Uh, my, my, it's not foolproof, but my first uh, defense up, uh, on like spotting fakes or disinformation is always the intent. And sometimes in the noise of social media, it's hard to surface intent. But when you see articles attacking someone or trying to make someone's reputation look bad, that's usually not kosher for normal news. No? Maybe on opinion columns, potentially, and then there are also what we call the hack, uh, what do you call this hatchet, <laughs> the hatchet writers. But uh, that should not be considered, uh, you know, on the same level as reporting. No, uh, unfortunately, social media doesn't distinguish, and you'll see an opinion column and news at the same level. So maybe that's uh, an opportunity for us. How do we pad this stuff better? How do we report it better? And we haven't actually brought to bear. There is the accountability of the platforms themselves. They're always a slippery fish. I'm talking right. about Facebook and Google and Twitter because they're global, uh, but they have representative offices here. There have been countries that have fined Facebook mm -hmm. and Twitter. You know, we can afford it for sure. But yeah, we have to at least show citizens na may we have teeth that we can make them accountable. So that's the second. Probably the third is this is an open challenge to our students, to our faculty. Just because we don't have existing tools right now that can fight this information effectively doesn't mean you can't create one. So we can't just be a passenger in this discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's innovate, you know? And this is what I was saying earlier, but di mag usap on journalists, programmers, scientists, because we're all siloed, even here in the UP. Uh, this is an opportunity for all of us. We don't have to be the passenger in this, in this fight. We can be part of the driver. You're all right. Uh, thanks, Dom. Um, what do you think, since the pag-uusapan na rin natin yung abuse, ha, yung mga iba't ibang sectors that may possible abuse of, of, of AI, about in the education sector, um, ano daw yung mga posibleng abuse ng AI? At anong pwede natin gawin? Okay, I think... Um, for uh, the obvious things are, are uh, students using something like ChatGPT to generate their essays. Right. right. And um, I've had, actually, there have been three instances already when people have written me saying, can I please have a copy of your paper entitled XYZ? And, and I write them back and I say, I don't think you have, I, I think you have the wrong person. I've never, I, I don't. I, I did not write a paper with that title. And then they've said, oh, we got it from chat GPT. I'm like, what is, what is happening? Um, anyway, but but aside from that, I think as educators, uh, we have to be really much more creative with our assessments. Um, we have to go back to maybe looking for, uh, looking at process, not just product. It's a lot more time consuming, unfortunately, but you know, if you can break up your requirements into stages where you can actually vet each deliverable um, as it progresses mm -hmm. and as it develops and that that's one way to guard against it I think um, the other thing which which actually relates to generative AI um, because I have friends in the creative arts as well who do design and who do illustration and um, the, the the challenges with generative AI is that uh, again, it's it's the ethical sourcing of data. Yeah. No. Um, the these these um, AIs were trained on publicly accessible images, but the original creators of the images were not credited. They were not uh, asked for their consent. Mm. They were not compensated for any of the of, for the use of their images. Um, and so, the, the, as a result, because the data was not ethically sourced, the product is questionable, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is something we hope to communicate to our students. And what, what we do is that um, 
is that we, we, we allow the use of these things to maybe generate ideas, but not to complete the, the ideas. And then again, um, finally, if you look at this, the realm of publication, a lot of big publishers have already uh, right. issued statements about when you may and may not use generative AI. And I think the consensus is you can use it to to style check, to, to mm. check grammar and so turn grammar Lee, but you cannot use it to write. Actually, okay. Um, still on the uh, the topic of uh, the education sector, Doctor Pena, comfortable na ba kayo sa pagcreate ng policies and protocols on the national level in the use of AI in Philippine classrooms? Uh, what do you mean? Should it be uh, generated by children? Yes, yes. yes. These discussions and now uh, we uh, we follow from uh, from schools, from students, and then upwards to children as well as from um, from that downwards. So, uh, so I, I suppose that the discussions will emanate because of these values. This because of these values, guidelines will emanate from these values discussions, whether they are bottom up. Or mm -hmm. downward, uh, going down to the level. Uh, and in addition, uh, one of the things as academics that we should consider is really the process of developing curricula. You know, uh, as we know, uh, developing curricula does take a long time. And as we have experienced, technology outpaces. You know, sometimes this process. So there must be uh, some way uh, that these emerging issues no, uh, are, are built in into discussions. No, uh, should they uh, find themselves in syllabi? Yes, I think that's a faster route rather than overhauling. You know, the curricula. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question for all our panelists. Um, let me start with uh, Mr. Hironaka. Joe, are, are you still there? Yes, Joe. Here's the question. Uh, do you agree that AI should be regulated? And if yes, what mechanisms can you propose for this? Do you agree that AI should be regulated? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for the uh, question. Um, uh, well, that's a very difficult question to ask a, a member of the UN Secretariat because we we um, we act on the on the will of all our member states, um, and clearly, all our member states unanimously um, supported the development of recommendations on AI ethics, and we'd like to see that process. Um, uh, uh, turned into concrete legislation at national levels, um, but it would not, not normally be my place to say whether these should, things should happen or not. Um, although it's true that um, we convene and encourage this type of normative instrument, particularly in human rights. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, um, Jean. Would you like to comment on that? Do you agree that AI should be regulated, and if yes, what mechanisms can we propose for this? Um, hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, AI technology, you know, akin to many other technological advancement, does not hold transformative uh, transformative potential. But it's definitely crucial to recognize that its use and the development should be gu uh, guided by the principles that prioritize. The well-being of all people, you know, especially uh, the most vulnerable, um, you know, such as the workers. Um, unfettered application of this kind of technology can definitely inadvertently lead to job displacement, job displacement, uh, income inequality, and an increased power dis uh, disparities. So yes, AI should be regulated, and this regulation does not mean that it will stifle innovation or progress. You know, quite the opposite, actually. In fact, consider the invention of um, of cars. You know, when they were first introduced, they were brought out brought about um, profound changes in the society, offering unprecedented speed and mobility. However, they also introduced new risks and challenges like accident and fatalities. And it was not until the introduction of seat belts. Um, which is a form of regulation, if you you will, that we could truly start to mitigate um, this risk 
uh, less. So the introduction of seatbelt, for instance, did not stop the growth or development of automotive industry. On the contrary, it made cars safer and thus more appealing to potential users. And then the rules were there not to limit growth, but to guide it in a direction that was more beneficial to society at large. So regulation um, in this case would work towards ensuring a fair distribution of the AI's benefit. You know, it could involve creating new job opportunities for those displaced by the technology or establishing standards in the tech industry. It's also about making sure the progress isn't leaving anyone behind and creating a wider gap between different classes of the society. Nice, nice. Thanks, Jean. Um, may gusto po bang comment from our panel here in PSSC? Sige, Dom. Sige, I'll jump on the car analogy. So, uh, you have two main occupations in cars. No? Uh, you have the mechanic and you have the driver. We license drivers, but we don't necessarily license mechanics. So food for thought. No? And a mechanic can fix the car. doesn't mean they can drive. And the other way around, you can be a Formula One driver. doesn't mean you can change a spark plug. So what's the difference between a mechanic and a uh, driver? The driver can kill. If they are drunk driving or they make a mistake or they press the accelerator instead of the brake, may, somebody could die. So on a fundamental level, in my view, if something is potentially harmful, we have to regulate it. But now we have to kind of nuance that. No? The reason why mechanics don't need necessarily uh, a license is they don't necessarily use the vehicle that could create a problem. So... Potentially, there, there's that logic. If you're a builder of AI, if you're a researcher of AI, you don't necessarily need to be restricted on research. But if you will be implementing AI or implementing systems, similarly, we have a privacy impact assessment. Maybe yeah. we need an AI impact assessment. Okay, set that aside. The big fear is always losing out on innovation. In that. And actually, that, I think that's a misnomer because it's really fear of the monopoly. Because right now, you only have like so many companies who actually develop these big models. There's a lot of power concentrated in the hands of a few uh, companies. That's actually the bigger challenge. And that's solely in the jurisdiction of the United States. Mm -hmm. So before we even think about regulating AI, how come we are not able to regulate Facebook? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an even more thought-provoking issue. Almost every government agency, local and national, without, with a few exceptions, have a Facebook page. Because logically, it's the, it's the easiest way to get in touch with citizens. They've taken the place of the website or the hotline. Facebook never went through a procurement process for that. So if there's something that goes wrong, down on page ng Pasig, no liability. So who gave Facebook the permission to become the sole hotline for the government? No? And I think this is a problem, not necessarily of Facebook per se, but actually it's a government issue. Why did we allow Facebook so much power? So that's an open-ended question. I think that needs a bit more debate. Uh, but again, you can't regulate Facebook, forget about regulating AI. But again, on a more fundamental level, if it's harmful, potentially harmful, we have to, we have to put some rules uh, on it. Right. Ako, parang ang dami natin kailangan, ano, we really just... Uh... Scratching on the surface right now. Ang, ang lalim kasi social media pa lang, hindi pa tayo masyadong handa pa lang. Dumating na yung revolution ng social media, hindi pa tayo handa with our policies and regulations. Now, the AI is here pa. Um, malapit lang na nag-clock, so ibig sabihin, uh, we are about to end our panel discussion. But let me just show you the final slide results, yung, yung ating tour kanina from our, from our uh, viewers. Um, so I will read the slide that you make for the communication budget of international competitiveness. AI powered future. Um, the number one answer was adaptability and innovativeness. And ito rin naman yung ina 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 as well. So innovativeness is very important. Nandiyan din yung word na collaboration and also the words policies, practices, and platforms. Now for our multiple choice um, questions, what do you think must be the priority in order to establish the basic conditions to integrate AI in communication and media education? 
Almost half of our respondents chose awareness on AI ethics. So ethics is really, really very important. All important. Coming in second, build infrastructures to support stable internet connectivity. And finally, our last question: Do you think that with the help of AI, we will achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030? 83 yes. percent of our viewers said yes. Yeah, that's very hopeful. Okay, so we only have one uh, time for one last question. It's a fast round for everyone. I would like to ask the, the panel. This is the question. How can we break through access barriers to AI in education for vulnerable groups such as impoverished young girls in third world countries like the Philippines? When we think, well, I, I, I'll just repeat the question for our keynote speakers um, via Zoom, who are joining us via Zoom, how can we break through access barriers to AI in education for vulnerable groups such as impoverished young girls in third world countries like the Philippines? So while our, our uh, speakers are, are composing their, their answers in their head, I'm just... Um, I'd like to get your eyes on the screen for our evaluation poll. To our Zoom attendees, please take this moment to answer a quick poll of just five questions to show our panel our great appreciation. They have graciously taken the time from the very hectic schedules to be with us today. So, pakisagot lang po. We will leave this poll open. This is the um, evaluation poll for our panelists. Ayan, tignan mo. The panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge on the topic. Wow, overwhelming. Brenda, the mga sagot. 87% uh, said strongly agree. All right. So while everyone is answering the evaluation poll for our keynote speakers, let me now ask our, our keynote speakers um, their thoughts on how can we break through access barriers to AI in education for vulnerable groups, such as impoverished young girls in third world countries like the Philippines. Maybe we can start with anyone here in the panel? Sige, Dr. Rodrigo. I, I think the one of the very first steps is really a massive infusion of investment in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, without the infrastructure, there is no AI. Right. Thank you, Dr. Rodrigo. Um, Dr. Pena. Uh, well, together with infrastructure, then you have the soft inf infrastructure, which is education. Yes. You know, uh, so uh, in the same way that there is free basic education and free tertiary education, as well as alternative learning systems, then these are the things that have to be built in. Uh, responsible use of media, responsible use of uh, uh, social media, and then digital uh, education. Uh, mm -hmm. among others. Uh, and I'd also like to pick up from what uh, uh, Joe Hironaka said a little while ago, that diversity works. Yes, uh, yes. Diversity works. So the more voices that are heard, you know, from minority groups, but of course, then, you know, you need, a, you need the hardware for them to latch on. But greater diversity is really good uh, in the long run, uh, whether it is for democratic systems or right. for developing leadership. Right. And then maybe here from, from Joe, from Joe first, um, the question is, how can we break through access barriers to AI and education for vulnerable groups such as impoverished young girls in certain countries like the Philippines? Thank you. Um, that's probably the most important question to address at this time. I'll try to be very concise. Um, I, agree, I agree fundamentally that it's connectivity and the way the UN works, um, um, UNESCO itself doesn't deal with uh, uh, the infrastructure of connectivity, uh, but we deal with the digital skills, the media and information literacy, and I think that's just as important as making an internet connection to a school. Um, yeah. uh, and as far as, you know, the, this inflection point where we are with, with uh, natural language models uh, and the ability to to translate fairly accurately news where um, where a, a journalist um, can do the final work um, it's I, you know I, I would really emphasize this point about about language diversity you, UNESCO my my boss um, 
um, has ca called on a thousand languages to be online at this moment. I think Facebook has less than 200. And as I said, it's, it's, a, and it's, um, it's feasible within this decade. This is the decade of in, uh, the UN decade for indigenous languages. And I hope um, many of the participants today will look at it this way, you know, and, the, and the, um, this use case. And, and, and I think, you know, the, what, uh, to the extent that it diversifies and extends audiences by creating different language versions, for instance, of Rappler or whatever, I think, I think there's, a, there's merit in exploring it both economically and also because it's the right, right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Um, maybe now to hear from Jean. Um, for I, I guess I would like to reiterate um, that um, education should be viewed as, or you know, education, including access to digital and AI-enabled education, is a fundamental right rather than a commodity. That's the first start. And in a society where access to education is seen as a basic right rather than a luxury, uh, the government and the society as a whole have a collective responsibility to ensure that everyone, irrespective of their social and economic background, has equal access to quality education. And that will include ensuring access to advanced tools like AI and en enabled learning platforms, especially for the most uh, marginalized and, and vulnerable. And education, as I've said, should not be viewed as a commodity to be bought and sold, but as a public good, freely available to all regardless of their economic status. And this perspective pushes against the neoliberal tendency to privatize education, turning it into a product for consumption rather than a means for individual and societal transformation. Thank you very much. Very powerful, powerful words. Thank you very much, Jean, for those words. Um, and now we want to hear from, from Dominic. Same question. Uh, four steps. Um, if I'm not mistaken, a Starlink dish, 30,000. So 3 million will get 100 dishes. Can we donate 100 dishes? Scatter it all over the place. So that helps with the access. Um, we have, I don't know how many major languages. Let's say 15 languages, one per region. I'm sure there are more. So 15 people who can translate. Then use AI to do the courses. Okay. Then finally, I think this is the most crucial there has to be government support for really bringing that education to the kind of the least uh, served uh, areas of the country. Did you know that in 2019, Finland made a decision to train 1% of their population in AI? They did it in one year. Finland. So they have about 5 million citizens, so they trained 50,000. Um, now they're tackling the entire European Union. It's a little bigger, half a billion, so 5 million people. For us, the equivalent is about a million, about 100 million Filipinos. Uh, up until recently, I was personally involved in a project called Sparta. This was funded by DOST, and we actually trained almost 50,000 people in data science and analytics. It's not 1% of the population. So in other words, we might be over building the challenge, but actually we have a lot of private sector foundations, we have a lot of... NGOs who could probably do it. I think somebody just has to say, here's the checklist, donate the Starlink dishes, get the volunteers. Actually, don't even have to be volunteers. They can be paid. You know, this should be a viable job for people. Uh, and then, balikan ko kay Dr. Pernia. Um, we're too focused on training end users. We need to train more teachers and we need to train more innovators. Uh, I think... Uh, having a call center industry was both uh, a boon and, a, and a, I guess a curse because it created a new middle class after 20 years, but now everyone wants to be an employee. I think we need more people who are willing to take a risk. But uh, I think it goes back to education. Okay. So yeah, get the dishes out, get the translations out, use AI to create the content, and then government provides the support. Let's just use Finland as a good model. Probably by the time this administration's term will end, there is a movement in that respect. Thank you, thank you. We'd like to thank all our speakers. Mr. Joe Hironaka, thank you very much. Jean Linus Bingo, thank you. 
Mr. Dominic Ligon, Dr. Maria Mercedes Rodrigo, and Dr. Elena Pernia. Thank you very much for answering all our questions. I know this is a very hectic season for all of you, and we really appreciate that you have shared your wisdom on our hybrid international simulation today. Palakpakan po muli natin ang ating mga speakers. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you for our closing uh, remarks and synthesis, the director of the Philippines Communication Society and one of the organizers of this hybrid international symposium to give the synthesis and closing remarks. Please let us all welcome Mr. Christian J.C. Samonde. Good day, everyone. All right. Um, to all our attendees, both on-site and online, to our distinguished guests, communication scholars, practitioners, students, as we come to an, to an end of this enlightening symposium on the impact of AI and media in education, I am pleased and grateful to deliver these closing remarks. In the last few months, we have witnessed an exchange of ideas, knowledge, and insights that have truly enriched our understanding of the evolving landscape of media and, and communication in the face of artificial intelligence. First and foremost, I express my heartfelt appreciation to every one of you who has contributed to the success of this symposium and the whole webinar series of PCS, Ayinako, Understanding the Impact of Artificial Intelligence on Media, Communication, Education. Our esteemed speakers, panelists, and presenters, your expertise and passion have captivated us all, shedding light on how AI has transformed our field. Their narratives have demonstrated the profound impact of AI on media and communication education in colleges and universities. Moreover, I extend my gratitude to our attendees, to scholars, practitioners, and students who have actively participated in the discussions and shared their valuable perspectives. Your engagement has added depth and diversity to the conversations, encouraging us all to think critically about the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Your enthusiasm and commitment to advancing our understanding of AI and media and communication education are commendable. Throughout this symposium, we have explored various facets of AI's influence on in our field. We have discussed the integration of AI and media production, the ethical considerations surrounding AI-powered algorithms, the impact of AI on journalism and news consumption, and the evolving role of educators in preparing students for an AI-driven future. Mr. Joe Hironaka shared that journalism education and practice now include working with AI tools. Students must develop technological competence to integrate AI into their ways of working. However, we should be wary of the ethical implications that may arise from this integration. Ms. Jean Lee's Dinko mentioned that narratives about AI are dominated by stories that describe it as human-like technology that has, that has the capacity to think abstractly and feel just like humans. However, according to Jean, AI simply follows rules that humans code. These innovations cannot determine or predict behaviors, and they do not have the capacity to think and will not exist without the subjective experiences of humans who coded their functions. On AI's practical implication, Mr. Ligot juxtaposed the dooms and the glooms of AI and AI tools. He shared that while these technologies assist and make our lives easier, AI comes with drawbacks that we should be familiar of. He further that regulatory policies and agenda must also be enhanced through multi-stakeholder approach to ensure important areas will be covered. The value of AI is also very apparent in the field of education. Dr. Rodrigo gave premium to AI and the importance of having concrete ethical policies and agenda to enable effective, adaptable, and flexible AI-enabled learning environments. These discussions have underscored the need for continued collaboration, and dialogue among scholars, practitioners, and students as we navigate and learn how to maneuver the ever-changing media and communication landscape. As we leave this symposium, I encourage every one of us to carry forward the knowledge and insights gained here. Let us embrace the opportunities that AI presents while criticizing it and remaining vigilant about its potential pitfalls. Let us continue to foster inter interdisciplinary research collaboration, and innovation as we work together to shape a future where AI is a powerful tool for improving media and communication education. Let us apply the lessons from the webinars and this international symposium to our classrooms. 
newsrooms, research endeavors, and communication practice. Let us harness the transformative potential of AI to advance media and communication education and in, in ensuring that our students are equipped with skills, knowledge, and ethical grounding necessary to thrive in this rapidly evolving landscape. Thank you to all our speakers from the day one of this webinar series for your invaluable contributions. I look forward to witnessing our collaborative efforts on the positive impacts as we shape AI's future in the media and communication education. And finally, of course, I express my deepest gratitude to my colleagues at the Philippines Communication Society and the TVUP, our sponsors and those behind the scenes and those who are behind the scenes who have worked tirelessly to make the symposium a reality. Your dedication and hard work have not gone unnoticed and we are indebted to, your, um, to you for creating this platform that has brought us all together. Thank you so much, everyone. Safe travels to all of us. And may your journeys be filled with continued success and meaningful connection. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat, Professor Christian Samonte. Christian, yung salang ang masasabi ko, tulang ang apat, dapat mas marami pang series na ganito. So, it anongs. Kulang. Ano ang sabi natin ng PCS for organizing this innovative audio series on AI? At sana hindi pa ito ang huli. Dapat mas marami pa. Mas marami pa kasi ang daming matututuhan. Thank you very much again, um, Professor Samonte, for that very comprehensive synthesis. As mentioned, this International AI Symposium is, of course, is the final installment of the four-part webinar series called Ay Nako, Understanding the Impact of Artificial Intelligence on Media and Communication Education. Pero hindi pa ito yung last to the Christian. Mas marami pa, kasi kulang yung apat. PCS held the webinar every last Wednesday of the month of March to June 2023, all of which will be available for you on playback at your convenience. So kung gusto nyo namin pa ulit yung lahat ng mga links kasi baka na information na ulit. Pwede nyo pa ito sa channel PCS sa PCS AI webinar PCS. Ayan. The Philippines Communication Society will be having its hybrid general assembly and general elections in following the program. So, hindi pa po katos ang program. PCS members and group standing who cannot join in person at the PSSC auditorium are enjoined to register in order to get the Zoom meeting link. So, this formally closes the four part series. I nako understanding the impact of artificial intelligence on media and communication education. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong makikinig. Ako po si Cara Dabi. On behalf of the Philippines Communication Society, let us strengthen our country's future through great communication. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Magandang hapon po. Our PCS board members are present as well as our speakers and our host and moderator for a quick group phone. Also, our PSSC Executive Director, Dr.